Hello, my name is Jake Kurzweil, and I'm a PhD candidate here at the Colorado School of Mines. And today I'm going to talk to you about the hydrologic response to forest fire mitigation in the lovely Ashland, Oregon, seen pictured right here behind us. This is a snow dominated watershed with a ski resort at the top that feeds a reservoir that supplies the drinking water to the town of Ashland, pictured here below. Now, Ashland is situated about 10 miles north of the California-Oregon border. So today we're going to talk about the backgrounds and needs for this study, the site characteristics, the methods, our selected results, and some future work we hope to conduct. Now if you're a fan of Game of Thrones, you'll realize that the story in the western United States is not that much dissimilar. It is a story of fire and ice. Now fire is the wildfires that we hear about all the time. We see images like this in the news of California completely inundated with smoke or the Pacific Northwest completely surrounded by wildfires. And I often joke with my friends that it's not just polar bears that are going extinct, it's also summertime campfires. So outside this anecdotal experience that we all have, there's actual data to show that wildfires are getting more intense. This study by Weber et al. in 2018 showed that from 1950 to 2017, that fire frequency is significantly increasing. Now, if we include 2018 and 2019, we would see that this trend is also being exacerbated. And it's not just the number of fires, it's also how big they are. From, so from this same study, if we look at acres burned per fire, specifically the mean, again from the same time steps from 1950 to 2017, we can again see a significant trend in the increase of acres burned per fire. Now this is because of two things. The first is that we're mismanaging our forests. We're not allowing forest fires to happen, which can lead to forest succession. So instead we get dense, homogeneous stand structures that are very susceptible to high intensity forest fires. The second is that climate change is leading to a longer fire season with hotter and drier summer months. Now this obviously has detrimental impacts on the built environment. This is a devastating photo from the Paradise Fire which took out the entire town and killed, I think, over a hundred people. But it also has impacts on hydrology. The first thing that I'd like to point out is when a forest fire happens, the plants die. And plants breathe just like humans. They put moisture up into the air, and we call that transpiration. So if we reduce the amount of trees, we're reducing the amount of transpiration and theoretically evaporation as well. The other thing that is happening is we're changing the soil properties which leads to less infiltration. So less rain is going into groundwater and more is going into the streams. And since the trees are not breathing water from the ground up into the atmosphere, again, we get more water into the streams. And a similar thing can happen with clear cutting because you're removing that vegetation, you're reducing the amount of evapotranspiration. So the second half of our story is ice, but in this case, it's snow. So this figure, Lee et al, 2017, shows what percentage of our stream flow comes from rain, seen in yellow, or snow, seen in purple and blue. So we can see in our water generating regions like the Rocky Mountains, the Cascades, and the Sierras, it's almost completely driven by snow. It's only in the coastal areas that we see rain dominating. But what about the total volume of water stored in snow? Well, Moat et al. set out to answer this in 2018 and showed that over the last 100 years, there is a significant decline. And this average significant decline represents about 29 million acre feet lost of water storage. Now, that's the equivalent of our largest reservoir in the Western United States. Not a good thing. So we're setting out to answer the question, can we combine the eco-hydrologic relationships that we know about, that if we reduce vegetation, we should get a reduction in evapotranspiration, which should lead to uh, more surface water runoff, while also reducing the risk of forest fires, kind of killing two birds with one stone. And a lot of people have, have tried to answer this as well. And they've said, yes, it does happen because we see with forest fires, and we see with clear cutting that we get this positive increase in surface water. But a lot of these are modeled. So we're actually gonna look at physically observed data and we're gonna answer the questions, how does total runoff respond to management strategies aimed at reducing forest fire risk? And what portion of that change is attributed to climate versus change in the forest structure? 
So here you can see our two basins. We have the west and the east. They feed the reservoir, which sits about right here. And this is showing the forest fire treatments throughout time. Now I wanna stress these are not fires. These are pre preventative methods uh, for forest fires. So we have a few different types. We have DM, which stands for density management, where we actually take out a number of trees. We have SL or surface and ladder treatment, where we take out vegetation that starts on the ground and kind of crawls up the trees that acts as a ladder for fires to go from the ground where they're not such a big deal to the canopy where they can have massive impacts. And the last one is UB or underburn, which is what you'd think of as a prescribed burn. So if we look throughout time, we can see that treatments end up being around cumulatively 16% for the west and about 32 or 33% for the east. And we think that these are actually overestimates. These are shape files provided by the Forestry Service. And when we looked at, the reason we think these are overestimates is when we looked at properties such as canopy cover, which is how much, how dense the structure is of the canopy and determines how much light or rain can make it in or snow makes it in, we only saw about a 3% drop over the same time period. And this kind of plays back later in, in our story. So how do we answer this question of, What's the hydrologic response and how much is because of climate and how much is because of the actual treatments themselves? Well, we always start with data. So we've got stream flow data from the USGS. We have precipitation and temperature data. We have evapotranspiration data or ET. And we have snow water equivalent data or SWE. And that is how much water is in our snowpack. These are large satellite images that are basically the size of the continent. We bring these down to the scale of our watershed. We take these daily values and we bring them to monthly and yearly time steps for processing. And we look at significant trends and change points. But to answer the question of how much is from climate versus how much is from the forest structure change, typically you'd have a paired catchment where you treat one and you leave the other as a control and you compare them. We don't have that opportunity here. So instead we use these climate elasticity models. And what we do here is we calibrate during the pretreatment period, which tells us how our watershed would respond if nothing had ever shifted. And then we apply those coefficients to the current period where we have the climate. And this tells us how the watershed would respond to the current climate if nothing had changed. We then select the best model via the Akake's information criteria on small sample. And that gives us our climate estimate. And we also have our estimate from the physical. So this gives us our observed. And so to get the change from the disturbance in the forest, we just subtract the climate from the observed. So let's look at some of our selected results. So these are runoff ratios. They represent precipitation to uh, discharge. And this is the West Basin. This is the East Basin. We're looking at per water year. And the top uh, red dotted lines represent the total area treated in each of the basins. And then these blue bars represent the trend. Now, if the story was holding true, we'd expect the more that we treat, the higher our runoff ratios we'd get. We'd get more water for the same amount of precipitation, but we don't. We actually see it declining. And we see when it starts that it actually goes down and then it kind of bumps back up. We see the same thing in both basins, which is also peculiar because they have a different amount of treatment. So we would expect them to kind of react differently if the treatments were having a, a large impact. Now, looking at our outputs from our observed values, which are seen in blue per water year, uh, this is again the Western Basin, the Eastern Basin, and again, these are our total treatment amounts. If, and the DQ is saying, what's the change in discharge from the pretreatment mean as a percentage. Our red is our estimated climate values, and then this green is what's left over, what we're saying is from disturbance. So again, we'd expect that if the narrative held true that we'd see this increase over time, but we don't. We see the same pattern with the runoff ratios. And in fact, in some cases, the disturbance is leading to a decline greater than what the climate was. So it's very interesting. And again, the story would be, if it's true, if we reduce the forest structure, we should be seeing this drop in evapotranspiration. So we looked at just that. This is total evapotranspiration in millimeters per water year in each basin west and east over each of the seasons. We saw no significant trends. So 
what we're saying is that it might not be the case. We are not seeing the same results that we would with large-scale fires or clear cutting. So management needs to take this into consideration. And in the future, we're looking to model future scenarios, apply these methods to sites in California, and expand to the southern third of Oregon. Thank you so much for your time. My name is Jake Kurzweil. Have a great day.